Michael. Um, thank you for the invitation um, and Alita and Wamsi for organizing the Zoom into schools. I think it's a fantastic opportunity to share um, our interests and, and specifically the, the components of what we want to do. Um, today, what I'll talk to you is something that I've spent the last 35 years working on, which is marine bioinvasions, um, the introduction of species from various places around the world, and biosecurity, which is really how we manage those bioinvasions. And we'll talk about um, both what they are, but also why um, we why we care, but also why we manage them. So I know that you have done some work in uh, marine science and probably have some understanding of of both local processes as well as some of the larger scale processes around the world. If you think about local processes, and I hope you can see this, the, the cursor here, um, oftentimes we think about recruitment into a patch and you, you think of species, they reproduce, and the marine environment is very interesting in that many species spawn into the, um, the open ocean and then you see recruitment dynamics on the scales of meters to maybe hundreds of kilometers, but they're very local in, in that context. And most of those recruitment activities occur singly. Um, so you have time scales of, of weeks to months, and you have distances of kilometers to hundreds of kilometers. Regional processes occasionally occur, and we usually think about these as the breakdown of biogeographic barriers. You can think of, um, you may have talked about the, the rise and fall of the oceans through time, and we would see the, the flooding of the Isthmus of Panama between North and South America, and the exchange of species between the Pacific and the Caribbean oceans, and periodically these occur. Almost inevitably, those are single events, um, but they occur over scales, distances of thousands of kilometers. And even more importantly, they occur over time scales of tens of thousands of years. Biological invasions represent novel additions to communities and ecosystems in that they can exchange species both locally, regionally, but even more importantly, between disparate locations that would never see the exchange of materials. So Europe to Australia or vice versa, Australia to North America in the Atlantic. These occur in spatial scales of tens of thousands kilometers, but they occur during windows of time that are equivalent to local processes. More importantly, not only do they transfer individual species, but they can, they can actually transfer entire communities. So we can see intact predator-prey relationships or competitive relationships with each other being moved on local scales, but across distances that we would never see in real life. So marine bioinvasions are the introduction of species from a native region or another introduced region to uh, a, a place where they never evolved, they never grew up. Um, many different names for them, introduced species, alien species, exotic species, non-indigenous species. Um, as a researcher, I prefer the term either introduced or non-indigenous because it's very clear that they are not native to the location that you're talking about. Introduced by definition means introduced by the agency of, of, of humans, of man. Um, not invasions. Invasions include those activities that are natural, like range extensions associated with climate change. Cryptogenic species is another term that's been coined, and crypto means hidden, genic means origin. Cryptogenic is literally, we don't know. It means we're not certain if it's a native species or it's an introduced species. And, and I'll talk about some of that, but you can believe that as we started exploring the world, we started introducing species before we even started looking. So even Darwin in his voyages around the world, most likely was on a vessel that transported many of those species um, into new locations, including the Galapagos Islands. 
A vector is the mechanism of transport, and we'll talk about those. And the pathway is the connection between two points or two regions. Now, the interesting thing is in the marine context, this is the way we define them. But if you're doing any work in biosecurity with terrestrial, or even as we talk about COVID and the pandemic that has just occurred, vector oftentimes is the individual or the person transporting material in the pathway may actually be the fact that we sneeze and it's an aerial transport pathway. So you have to keep in mind where you're talking and what the definitions of, of terms are. Additionally, biosecurity is a, a term that was coined in Australia, New Zealand, way back in the 1980s. Um, literally, it means biological security. For Australia, New Zealand, we typically refer to this as the management and control of introduced species. In some locations, this has included native pests like the crown of thorn sea star, native to, the, to Australia, to the Great Barrier Reef, but occasionally reaching outbreak proportions. Similarly, if you go into North America and Europe, biosecurity includes elements of pandemics, but in, more importantly, it also includes bioterrorism. So uh, the use of, um, of biological material in a terrorist or in a war-like setting. So one reason that we care about bioinvasions in the marine environment is because the potential impacts into new locations include environmental, economic, social, and cultural, and even in the marine environment, including impacts on human health. We know that economic interests, and especially um, as, as we come out of the pandemic that we're currently in, that the economy is extremely important in terms of how we manage and how we um, understand, but those values are also what represent the elements that we're trying to protect. The marine industries in Australia contribute about $65 billion a year to the economy, so we can appreciate any introduction that would damage those elements or those aspects would have a significant impact. Similarly, environmental values such as ecological assets, ecosystem services are critical to what we deem to be functioning activity. As Australians, we're very protective of the native species that we have. We have a very high endemicity. And as a consequence, there's a, a very strong protectionism that we put in play. But similarly, social, recreational, and cultural values are significantly important and threatened by introductions of non-native species. Um, you can imagine a, an, an animal or a plant being introduced that would foul fishing lines, um, so block your ability to fish, or even um, an introduced algae that washes up onto the beach and causes a very significant wreck would therefore decrease the amenity values of that location. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily go along, go walking along the beach if you couldn't actually reach the, the foreshore. If we look at some uh, marine bioinvasions, globally we've had harmful algal blooms, and these are um, toxic dinoflagellate algae that have been introduced around the world. They cause human morbidity and mortality, so um, diuretic shellfish poisoning, amnesic shellfish poisoning are two of the, the classic symptoms that we, we see. In North America, the zebra mussel was introduced into the Great Lakes, um, not a marine system, a freshwater system, but it's caused a huge amount of economic impact, specifically associated with the blocking of um, freshwater intakes, both for drinking water, but also for cooling plants along the Great Lakes. In Europe, the Chinese mitten crab was introduced in the early 20s um, and, sorry, 100 years ago, um, and has caused a huge amount of damage to the canal systems um, throughout uh, the inland, uh, inland ports. And then the Japanese kelp on Daria was introduced, causing both economic and environmental impacts along the Atlantic and the Mediterranean coast. Here in Australia, we've had a number of introductions, including um, harmful algal blooms, but you may know about the Northern Pacific sea star introduced into Tasmania and into Victoria, Asterias amurensis. Um, it has reached densities of, uh, population densities of about 10 million, 20 million individuals in Port Phillip Bay alone. 
and just sweeps across in these large waves of individuals eating everything in its path. The Mediterranean fanworm, Sabella spallanzani, was introduced into Australia, starting in Western Australia, it appears, um, and reached a very high density, causing a significant loss of, um, of habitat. It became a monoculture, but also um, it consumes material from the plankton, and as a consequence, competes with native species that rely on filter feeding. And then again, the Japanese kelp was introduced into um, Tasmania in the early 80s and has since spread into Victoria as well. Um, Andaria is an aspect dominant, but also competes or outcompetes native species. So, as I've kind of indicated, bioinvasion impacts are largely species based. And so, as we move to act upon them, we tend to concentrate on individual species that we look at. Um, community level effects do occur, and specifically, they occur with introduced species combinations where we see a predator and a prey or two competitors. And in fact, many introduced species create um, an opportunity for additional invasions to occur. This, this effect is often known as invasional meltdown, um, where one species get in, gets into a system, causes a degradation of the community, and then you start to see additional invasions occur into that space. All species have the potential to invade, and I think that's something that we often forget. Um, an introduced species isn't a special species per se. It's just one that has had an opportunity and has insinuated itself into a new community. Unfortunately, we know a relatively small number of marine species. We probably have, have identified or seen about 10% of the total known um, number of um, marine species. And of those, we have a relatively small proportion that we've actually named, um, let alone studied and, and know something about them. So many of the introductions that we have have become very apparent to us because um, all of a sudden they appear and then they start to grow and, and control communities or control um, area and habitat. So a pragmatic approach for us to figure out who the next species coming in might be is to kind of look at who's been introduced elsewhere and what are the continuing risks to inform management. If we look around the world, um, and this is truncated in the late 90s, um, what we start to see is this J-shaped curve, this hyper-acceleration of invasions through time. Now, in part, that has been uh, associated with the amount of looking, the effort that we put in, but also it's the change in the vectors that we see. So around the 1900s is when we started to see metal or steel hulled commercial vessels. And of course the fleet grew significantly. With steel hulled vessels, we also had the advent of steam instead of sail. And so suddenly we were moving around various parts of the world much more rapidly. In addition, those steel hulled vessels meant that we had the introduction of ballast water instead of ballast stone. And so a new mechanism of in introduction occurred. But you can see here in Australia, a hyper acceleration since about the 1950s in terms of the number of invasions that have occurred. And that is both a combination of the amount of effort in terms of looking, but coupled with the fact that many of our invasions are subtitle. So around the 1940s, 1950s is when scuba diving became very relevant. And as a consequence, we were able to explore the ocean in much greater depth. I should also point out that um, the only reason the UK is down at 50 is because they stopped counting after 50. So we have a number of regional, national, and even local assessments of varying quality for invasion detection. And I think you guys have probably been, um, you've probably been taught about surveys and how we go and look for things. You can appreciate that if we go and look, actively look, and we have a controlled scientific method of looking, then both presence and absence are valid. But if instead all we're doing is harvesting citizen science that says, oh, by the way, I found something, then the only thing that we actually can 
count on is presence because we have no idea how many people looked and didn't find things. Similarly, I, I just remind you that the native introduced status is something that we have a difficulty applying, especially for older invasions. Those older invasions are cryptogenic. We don't know them. But similarly, species that we haven't named yet are also cryptogenic because we don't know where they belong. So here are some of the regional evaluations. And you can begin to see the United States, 298 species, Baltic Sea, 96, um, New Zealand, 167. Many of these are quite old. And it, down here in Australia, back in 1990, we only knew 62 species that were there. But with greater effort from 2000 to 2008, we've grown from 62 species to recognizing that we now have just under 500 species in Australian waters. So as I said, 1990, 62 introduced and cryptogenic species known in Australia. This is an image of um, a, a piling down in Albany um, with some of the methods that we use to collect material and identify what we could find. Using these across all of Australia, we now have an understanding of about 629 introduced species as of 20, 2010. Um, this has been both a literature, museum collection, and surveys, those port surveys. And you can see that there's a very strong latitudinal gradient. In the tropics, we have very few recognized non-natives. And in the temperate zone, specifically down Victoria, Tasmania, we have a very significant number of both introduced and cryptogenic species um, in, in those regions. If we look across the world, um, and we did the same thing, we collected material both from uh, the literature, museums, as well as from colleagues that work in various locations, we can identify about 2,700 introduced marine and estuarine species, somewhere they've been introduced. And this, this map, this circular table, allows us to see where material or where species originated from and where they've been introduced to. Um, we also know that this is 2010, so we're 10 years on, so this is an underestimate and very much out of date. If we look across the globe at the bioregions, and these are very large-scale bioregions that we're using here, you can see that virtually every place in the world has been um, has received introductions, but more importantly, Mediterranean and Australia and New Zealand are the regions that have received the greatest number of invaders. Um, equally, many of the invaders in other parts of the world have come from those two regions as well. And if we look at the phyletic uh, response in terms of participation, uh, 14 phyla have about 90, 95% of the representation in those 2,700 species. Introductions have come from all 35 phyla, 35 out of 39, with 55% of those coming from these three groups, the chordates, which are both ascidians and fish, the mollusks, um, gastropods and bivalves, approximately equal numbers, and then arthropods across a variety of classes. Similarly, uh, if we look at the distribution, 70% of species are known only to be introduced into one bioregion. So many of these species are one-offs in terms of their activities. Um, some of those, like the Asian clam, Patama corbula amurensis, introduced into San Francisco Bay, or Asterius amurensis, that northern Pacific sea star I talked about, have only been introduced into one location. If we start looking at other high profile species, you have Sibella spallanzani, the Mediterranean fanworm that's introduced here, but also into other regions, and the lionfish, Taros volitans. Umbria has been introduced into bi five bioregions, and then we have only 20 or 1.1 of the total uh, percent of the total number of introductions found in more than nine bioregions. These two, Arsinus manus, the European shore crab, introduced here into Australia as well, and Bugula neritina, a bryozoan, have what we deem to be characteristics of super invaders. 
So if we look at the patterns of connectivity related to trade, we can see that early in our Western movements around the world, we had relatively restricted patterns of movement. And these, as I said, took a long time. Um, earlier than 1860, we were talking somewhere between four months to get from Europe into Australia. As we move through in time, you can start to see that not only is the density of the activity higher, but the speed of that activity also has increased, reducing it down to months instead of several months. And then the modern era, um, 1980 really to present, um, the global trade now, it's only two weeks to get from the Western uh, Eastern Pacific to the Western Pacific. So two weeks from California to Australia, three weeks to get from Europe to Australia. So relatively short periods of time. And you can imagine species that are feeding in the open ocean. Um, the open ocean tends to be oligotrophic, so have very little food available. Um, those filter feeding species would, would find a shorter time period much less stressful and therefore much more likely to survive. So that represents a change in the likelihood of an invasion being successful. The, the number of transport vectors um, obviously has changed through time, but you can see that there are a huge number of, of activities. We've intentionally introduced a number of species through agriculture, aquarium trade, fisheries stocking. We've intentionally introduced species so that we can fish them and then obviously live seafood trade. A number of unintentional transport vectors um, have also been identified. I've talked about ballast water and I'll go into both ballast water and biofouling in a, a, little bit, um, a little bit more detail. But we can appreciate that aquaculture, while we intentionally introduce things like the Atlantic salmon into Australia, there are other things that are moved with the gear or with the food or with the products. Um, so many of the introduced diseases have been brought with the intentional introductions of, of salmon or oysters. Similarly, um, probably around the time many of you were born, we actually had the introduction with um, the food for tuna farming from, uh, from South America, the herpes um, pilchard virus, and that caused significant problems throughout southern Australia, from western Australia to, to Victoria, and even over into New Zealand. And then many packing materials, especially for live bait, um, are uh, oftentimes seaweed, and they're frequently introduced as well. So ballast water is used by commercial vessels, predominantly very large vessels, to maintain the trim and stability of the vessel when it's not moving goods around. So you can appreciate these bulk cargo containers or this wood chip container load up in one location with wood chips, they move to another location and they offload. But they don't load up wood chips and move back, they load up water instead and they bring that water back with them into the new location. When they get to that new location, they come into port and they offload that ballast water as they're loading on cargo. So, while it's largely restricted to commercial vessels and naval vessels, um, it's critical to the vessel operation and therefore all vessels actually do undertake this activity. Ballast water derives from offloading ports and only a portion of arriving vessels are in ballast. Um, so the management options are considered greenfields activity as in we know that we do this, it's a contained activity and therefore we've moved on trying to manage ballast water by the creation of a, a global convention that dictates what we will do with some technological solutions to that. Vessel biofouling on the, on the other hand is associated with all vessels, not restricted to commercial and naval vessels. Basically, whenever you put something into the water, species settle on it. And we can appreciate that on a vessel, there are not only the exposed hull surface, but there are also all these little niche areas where you can get these things that come in. They're not exposed to the hydrodynamic forces as the vessel moves through the water. So these include, you know, the thrusters, the propellers, the keel, 
Um, some of the areas of sea chests where water intake is, is protected. Um, and the consequence of that is you get a large variety of species that are suddenly protected from the exposed environment. But even more importantly, those are areas that are probably under um, protected from the anti-fouling tanks that we use. So in, in this context, um, biofouling began with the earliest use of vessels, so centuries ago. Um, and as I indicated, many of the early vessels of exploration, um, especially the ones that hit reefs and sank, um, were very good vectors of transport for these species. Um, vessel biofouling does impact on the efficiencies of vessel operations, but only on um, those areas that are exposed to the seawater. In those protected areas, the operator cares a little less about those elements. You can also appreciate that biofouling derives from all areas of operations. So every place a vessel is visited, there will be additional species that settle onto that hull. So if I look at the vessel and I know that the last time it was dry docked and cleaned was five years ago, every place it's visited potentially has contributed species. So if we look at the 2,700 species and we try and figure out what mechanisms of introduction may have occurred, what, how did they get to the new location? We see that vessels contributed the most. Vessel biofouling and vessel ballast water are the two greatest mechanisms of, of introduction with 44% of the species through vessel biofouling and 36% of species through ballast water. So just a kind of recap, all bioregions around the world have been invaded to some extent. 44% of those through bio, biofouling, 36% through ballast water, and the vast majority have a restricted global distribution, which can be interpreted as the opportunity for human-mediated further spread. And in fact, if we look in Australia, a study that we did about, um, about five years ago, indicated that older invasions, the blue lines, are far more widespread than younger invasions, the, the red lines. So that gives us an indication that for individual species, through time, you will see a greater amount of introduction. Similarly, a large proportion of marine species remain undetected, that is never observed or they're never named. So a large number of those species remain cryptogenic. And if we look at those Australian port surveys, we can see that while we saw relatively few introduced species and cryptogenic species in the tropics, we actually see a very large number of cryptogenic species in those regions, which means there could be some hidden invasions in those locations. So why we do biosecurity? Well, to protect those environmental, economic, and sociocultural values. And these are some examples of introduced species, Asteria semirensis, the Northern Pacific sea star, the Japanese kelp on mussel lines here. This is a native Australian species introduced into New Zealand on a, a seagrass bed. Oops. And um, of course, our favorite uh, thing to eat, um, Pacific oysters that have gone feral and escaped from the farms. So um, this is a classic vessel. And unfortunately, um, it sank, but it also had a non-native species that introduced it into the Chatham Islands in New Zealand. So a, a unique instance, a one-off, but a devastating result in terms of the consequences. Um, and happy to answer questions now. Hi. Is it on? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, which species had had the worst impact in Australia? <laughs> that, well, that's a, that depends on what values you wish to protect, right? So um, if you look at Asteria samurensis, the Northern Pacific sea star, it has reached really high um, numbers, but in a relatively small location. So it's impacted both the scallop fisheries, um, a number of the native fisheries. It's potentially affecting uh, 
the um, endangered handfish or two species of endangered handfish in Tasmania. Um, I'd, I'd list that very high in terms of the impacts that it's had. And certainly it's now in Melbourne um, and it has been for a number of years. So it's in Port Phillip Bay. But what we're seeing is it's starting to get out and moving um, eastward towards Gippsland and it's recently gotten into Corner Inlet. Um, so I'd, I'd list that very high. But similarly, I think if you look at um, the Pacific oyster, the Pacific oyster is intentionally farmed in many regions, so it has a very positive effect. Simultaneously, it reaches very high densities when it goes feral, and we've seen it spread throughout South Australia, here in Western Australia, um, in Victoria, and more importantly, it is a, uh, a host for many diseases, and as a consequence, those diseases affect native oysters as well. So those are, those are two species that I think are the, the highest impacts that we've seen. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, are there any species invasions that have gone beyond repair? And if so, what can we do about them? <laughs> um, well, there are many species that have gone, uh, are very widespread. And as a consequence, we, we don't think that we can do much about them. Unfortunately, in the marine environment, um, we spend relatively little money. Um, and because it is out of sight, out of mind, we tend to think that by the time we find it, you know, the marine environment is, whole, is so well connected that once it's there and established, there's very little we can do. The reality is that um, we spent, with the, the black mussel that was introduced into Darwin, we spent $2.1 million to eradicate that. And that was actually in um, two locked marinas. So these are gated marinas that uh, we have fairly significant control over. But if you look at some of the terrestrial responses, $2.1 million is a drop in the bucket. Um, the red fire ant that was recently introduced into Fremantle, they spent several million dollars in the delimitation evaluation itself. So it's, it's a bit of horses for horses. Um, if, if we spent the appropriate amount of money, we could do something about a lot of the in, invasions. It's just a matter of how much we value the potential impacts. Um, are GMO fish in aquaculture likely to have negative impacts if they escape farms? Sorry, say, say that again. Are genetically modified fish in aquaculture likely to have negative impacts if they escape farms? Well, that's a good question and, and probably not a blanket answer. Um, it depends on what genetic modification has occurred and whether, um, whether that genetic modification makes it a far more um, aggressive species. So if we think about it, we've genetically modified oysters, Pacific oysters, so that they will grow faster and grow larger and reproduce more. Um, if they escape into the wild, then the likelihood is they will grow faster than native species, therefore outcompete them in the native environment. They'll outreproduce them, which means they'll also not just grow faster, but recruit more. And so what we'd likely see in terms of fer feral oyster populations is that they would become aspect dominance and, and really dominate the system um, and potentially locally eradicate or drive native species extinct. Um, the other impact of GMOs is if you see introgression, if you see them crossbreeding with native species. And there are many species that will do that. Um, elsewhere in the world, we've seen genetically modified Atlantic salmon um, being introduced into other locations and breeding with the native salmon populations there. Now that's unlikely to occur in Australia. We don't have, we, while we have salmonids, we don't have salmonids that interbreed with Atlantic salmon. Um, but you can imagine a number of these elements having that potential for interbreeding. 
Uh, are there any spaces that have had what? Are there any spaces that have had bad impacts around the world that have not yet reached Australia? Quite a few. Um, so if we look at some of those species that I showed you on the um, on that slide of the number of bioregions, uh, Teroas volatans is the the lionfish. Now the lionfish. Um, we have very similar species, but we don't have that species that was introduced into the Caribbean um, and into the Atlantic portion of the U.S. Native from um, the eastern, uh, or sorry, the eastern Mediterranean, um, western uh, Indian Ocean. And what we've seen with that species, it, it has reached population abundances at about 100 to 200 meters and is causing a significant number of impacts with the the native fish stocks in, in those regions. Um, there are a, a variety of other species that affect aquaculture that have yet to come to Australia. And some of those um, species like Potamocorbulus amurensis, while it's only been introduced into San Francisco Bay, it caused a significant loss of plankton, which decimated the native species in that community. And, literally shifted the community um, from a clear or from a turbid water system, so a very muddy water system, to a clear water system in the course of two years. Um, so there are a number of those elements. Um, so yes, there are a number of species that could still get here that would cause problems. I also remind you that Australia is a big place, as you guys are aware. Not every species that's been introduced into Australia is everywhere in Australia. So we still are at risk, especially Western Australia, from Eastern state introductions and vice versa. Um, one question from me. Um, are we, do you think, in your opinion, are we doing enough currently in Australia with our management and prevention and control or even prevention of, like, of ongoing um, outbreaks? Are we doing enough at the moment? Yeah, so Australia um, has led the world with, with New Zealand in terms of marine biosecurity. We've certainly, uh, we drove the attention towards ballast water. We raised the profile in terms of understanding the scale and the scope of invasions. Um, largely the reason that I moved to Australia in the 90s was um, the opportunity to, to look at a continental, a continental scale of um, marine invasions. In recent years, um, there has been a strong shift towards prevention and Australia is now pushing biofouling as um, the next thing that needs an international agreement in terms of how we will manage that. So Australia is very strong in prevention. Um, in terms of response, uh, recently and especially post blackstripe mussel, there's a reticence to act upon non-natives. Um, there's a very significant belief that uh, once it's here, once it's established, there's very little we can do with it because it costs too much. Um, and the only things that we have acted on are ones that have significant economic impact. Um, so, you know, from my opinion, yes, we could do more, but it's always a question of where you spend your money. Um, as we've seen um, with COVID, there is a very significant biosecurity response when it has to do with human, uh, human health. Um, and so there are a few species where human impacts will drive us to respond. 